Okay. Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday to you. Hope you have a great week ahead of you. So I'm Pam Ishmael. I am a food science faculty, and I teach mostly uh, seniors uh, in food analysis. You'll see me if, um, if you are a food science major. And I'm here just guest lecturing for proteins because I love proteins. No one can lecture proteins but me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, George is out of town, and he asked me to give these lectures. I gladly am giving them. And um, I'll have a few show and share items I would like to share with you and ask you a few questions before we start. To give you an idea of protein functionality and how it, it contributes to the structure in food. So first off, what I have here for you is I have three ounces milk and three ounces yogurt. I weighed them on my balance in the kitchen. So I guarantee you they're the same weight. So which sample, milk or yogurt, has more moisture content? Do you all agree that it's milk? Raise your hand. OK, guys, put your hands down. No, they're equal. Moisture content is the same. Do you know how you make yogurt? Does anybody know how you make yogurt? Yes, yeah, so how do we make yogurt, Molly? Uh, culture. But yeah, you put yeast, um, yeast culture. And then what happens is you put it at 37 or 40 degrees Celsius, and you incubate, that is, for a few hours. And what happens to the pH? It drops. It drops to 4.6. It's the isoelectric point of casein. At that point, the protein comes together and start forming a three-dimensional network, start forming a gel. And a gel entraps moisture. So you don't lose moisture. It's just the texture, the protein texture, made it look like a gel. Yogurt is a gel. It's a soft kind of gel. But it is a gel. So moisture content is the same. Fascinating proteins. All right, so now I have yogurt and I have three ounces of cheese. Which one has more moisture? <clears throat> now you don't want to say. Come on. Yogurt? Yogurt. Raise your hand. Okay, you're right. <laughs> So with cheese, what happens is a different mechanism. It's coagulation, not gelation. So there is a difference of how the proteins come together. They can either form a coagulum or a gel. When you form a coagulum, what happens is, I don't know in which class you learn how to make cheese, but at some point you should be learning that. So what you do is you put an uh, enzyme, in this case Molly, it's enzyme in this case, so you put um, um, chymo, chymo, chymotrypsin, chymotrypsin, yes, um, or renin, it's called renin, or chymotrypsin. So what happens is the enzyme breaks down the proteins in a way that instead of forming a 3D network or a gel, what they do is they come together very, very strongly, they fuse together. So they fuse, they, they form uh, calcium phosphate bridges and they and they form hydrophobic interactions so strongly that they expel the water. So when you're making cheese, you see that a curd is formed and the whey gets separated from the curd, so the water, the moisture. And then you take that curd and you press it even more, and then you go through the process of making cheese. But again, when you press it, you lose more moisture. So definitely the cheese has less moisture than yogurt. Okay. So. Gelation, coagulation, coagulum, and a gel. So yogurt is a gel, cheese is a coagulum. Okay, so let's say you want to make bread. So you start by forming a dough. I made this dough last night. So I put just a simple dough, flour and water, and I kneaded it, okay? So I just started kneading until it formed a consistent structure. So now I have a very pliable, like Play-Doh dough. Okay, so it can elongate and then you can shape it the way you want. What causes this pliability 
or elasticity and viscosity because you have extensibility and you have elasticity. So it extends and go back to its original shape. What causes this in your dough? The gluten. So in wheat, do we have gluten? Come on. No, we don't have gluten. We have gluten forming proteins. So you have glidens glutenins. When you put them in water, they're going to interact with each other and form a viscoelastic network known as gluten. So there's no gluten in wheat. There's gliden and glutenin, gluten forming proteins that form a viscoelastic structure. Here it is. If you can see this from afar, so what I did with part of the dough this morning is I washed it. So I took the dough, part of it, and opened the tap water and started washing the starch out. When I did that, I ended up with this gooey, elastic thing. It's the gluten. So this elastic component is what gives the structure, the viscoelastic structure of your dough. So the protein in the wheat is responsible for a loaf volume. So if you're making a loaf bread, you want it to rise, right? You want to have some volume to it. You want to hold the air bubbles and you don't want it to collapse. So the gluten in the dough is what makes the dough rises, the elasticity and viscosity, the viscoelastic properties. So it rises, but it doesn't break because it's elastic enough, it's strong enough to hold the air bubbles. The air bubbles are basically your moisture that evaporates upon a baking. So you will form these cells, and then you will have a very nice structure. So a strong gluten, the stronger the gluten, the higher is the loaf volume, because you have this strong elasticity, and then you have this strong hold of your air bubbles. So another type of bread is pita bread. Are you familiar with pita bread? OK. So pita bread is another form of bread. It's flat, OK? So you don't want volume. You do not want it to rise. You want it, when you make the flat bread, you get the dough, and then you uh, extend the dough to make it a thin sheet. You don't want it to be too elastic. If it was too elastic, elasticity by definition, it goes back to original shape and it shrinks, and then the, dough, the bread becomes thick. You don't want that in pita bread. You want a very nice, thin bread. So what happens is you choose a wheat product or wheat grain that has less strong of a gluten-forming protein. You have higher gliadin, which is the extensible, responsible for extensibility, and lower glutenin, which is responsible for elasticity. So for this type of bread, you want what we call a weaker flour, flour that causes the dough to extend more than, uh, more than being elastic. You don't want the volume. You want the flat, flattening shape. You don't want it to be elastic, and you don't want it to be thick. OK. Another type of baked product is a pound cake. OK. How elastic is the pound cake? None at all. So you just break it, it breaks. So of course, your loaf bread doesn't break that easily. It's too elastic. So here, what's causing the structure really is a little bit of flour, not a lot, and eggs. So here you want the emulsifying properties of the protein, and you want the foaming properties of the protein. So the eggs obviously have the emulsifying proteins and the foaming proteins in them. So you, because you, your batter, your cake batter, has a lot of moisture in it and fat. So you want them to mix properly. So you want that emulsion to form. And when, the, when you bake the cake, you want to form those, those air cells as well. So you want some foam in there as well. So in this case, it's the egg protein that causing the shape. It's not elastic protein, doesn't form elasticity. That's why it is soft, crumbles, and you enjoy eating it without having to chew on it. OK. Another form. So I have jelly here. So jelly is made up of what? 
still have gelatin, sugar, and it's mostly water, right? It's most, more than probably, more than 85 to 90 percent water. Thank God it didn't fall. Okay, so the idea is it's a gel, right? What's the percentage of protein in this, do you think? Give a number. I just gave away something I shouldn't have. Give a number. Any number. Good morning. Ten. Ten percent. Do you agree? If not, if ninety percent moisture, ten percent protein, right? No. There's sugar. It's really one percent protein. So one gram and hundred gram. One gram of protein made this solid. That's the power of protein. So. You, heat, you put protein at a low concentration with water, you heat it up, especially gelatin, so it will form a nice gel that holds a lot of water. So that's the gelling power of proteins. So here are a few examples then of the structure that proteins are responsible for in yogurt and cheese and different types of baked products and in jelly. Of course, there are so many different applications. So if we look at is this dying out, Okay, here we go. So if we look at the different functionality of the protein and the different applications, so here's a summary table. So you have the proteins are soluble. That's another thing that I didn't show you an example of. You know, athletes like to build their mus muscles, right? And then they like to regenerate their muscles after an exercise. So what's better than a protein drink, a shake, high in protein? So you want to choose a protein that is soluble. Not all proteins are soluble in water at different pHs. So you would select a protein that goes in water very quickly, like whey protein from milk. Goes in water very quickly so you can have high percentage of protein in a beverage, and the beverage still stable and drinkable and tastes good. Um, of course, protein holds water. Because they hold, hold water, can use them in applications like meat patty. So in meat patties, what happens when you have a meat patty and you cook it and you put it, what do you see comes out of that meat? What? What comes out of the meat when you cook it and you put it on a plate? Water. Cineresis, water and fat comes out. So there is a cook loss. So if you are buying the meat patty to put it in a McDonald's Big Mac, you don't want to lose weight because water is money. So you want to make sure that water and fat remains in that meat to get the, to get the money worth of it. So oftentimes they add whey protein, for example. The whey protein holds water, help in emulsification, help hold the, the, the fat as well. So that is a application. Do you know what surimi is? Huh? No? It's like a fish paste kind of thing. Ooh, yeah. But you also add protein to it to make sure that it holds well water. You don't get cinereses upon uh, processing and cooking. Yogurt, sometimes you add additional protein so that you don't see cinereses. Sometimes when you open a a container of yogurt, you see some water on the top. That's not a really attractive quality. So you want to make sure that the water is held, so sometimes they add a little bit more protein. Of course, gelation for all type of meat product, tofu, for example, from soy, they, uh, you add sometimes during the processing some calcium in there to help calcium bridges between the protein and form a nice 3D gel network. Emulsification, of course, mayonnaise, cell dressing, where you, whenever you have aqueous and you have lipid or, or oil or fat, you want them to stay mixed together so protein plays a role there. And foaming, you know, you have ice cream. Ice cream is a system of foam and emulsion because you have the aqueous, you have the fat, so you want them to be emulsified and you want to incorporate air. So you have a foaming system. Uh, cake, sponge cake, a lot of foam there, marshmallows, meringues, etc. All of these products require holding of the foam. Once the foam generated, you want a matrix that holds the foam and does not allow it to escape. Okay. 
This is George in disguise, you know. I just took the face out and somebody else. Okay, so what's the role of protein uh, in our diet? Of course, first thing is muscle building, but not all of us are muscle builders, but definitely it's, it's used for muscle building and muscle generation. But it has obviously a more important function, the example, the nutrition function, nutritional quality. Nutritional quality is basically the, the essential amino acid. Oh, okay, I forgot this doesn't work for me. Is there a, there is no other pointer? No, don't worry about it. Okay, so essential amino acids, um, basically the amino acids that the body does not generate, you want them from outside. And also there is a minimum requirement per day for intake of protein, which is 50 grams per day. Each one of us requires that minimum amount of protein per day. Another function is ease of digestion. Let's say you've gotten this 50 grams of proteins. However, it's not all of it the body can digest. Example, plant proteins are not easily digested as animal proteins. So 50 grams of plant protein, might, you might only be able to digest 40 grams of it. Okay? Have you heard of PD-CAS? Do you know what PD-CAS is? If you know, raise your hand and tell me what it is. Okay. Yes, so it takes into account the amino acid profile and takes into account protein digestibility. So PDCAS is protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. So you take the first limiting amino acid. What I mean by first limiting is the lowest amount of amino acid that is essential. So if you have, you have eight essential amino acids, let's say lysine is the lowest present in the lowest concentration in wheat. So lysine in wheat is the limiting, first limiting amino acid. So you take the first limiting amino acid and you multiply that by the digestibility of the protein. So the digestibility of protein, I mean how much nitrogen that from the ones that you absorbed or ingested got absorbed. So the total nitrogen that got absorbed relative to the nitrogen that was consumed. So you'll learn about PDCAS and food analysis if you are a food science major. We'll talk more about that there. So PDCAS, the maximum PDCAS is one. So if you have a protein like casein, casein has a PDCAS of one. P protein has a PDCAS of 0.8. So the maximum is one. And as the number goes down, that means the protein has a limiting something, either limiting in amino acids or limiting in digestibility. So why I'm saying all this? Because quantity does not, is not the one that you would report here. So 36 grams of protein, for example, is being supplied. If this has a PDCAS of 1, then 36 out of 50 is equivalent to 70%. But if you have 36 grams or let's say 40 grams or what have you and it's only or 50 grams and if it only has a PDCAS of 0.8 then only 40 grams are available out of the 50. So you have to think about that. It's not just the quantity, it's the quality that matters and the quality that goes in the calculation of percent daily value, not the entire quantity. Okay. <clears throat> There are physiological benefits of protein. So it's not just amino acids and digestibility. It's also what health contribution a protein gives you. For example, in 1999, the FDA approved a claim that 25 grams of soy protein a day as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. So this claim came after many, many many studies that proved the association of soy protein and cardiovascular health. So that's a physiological benefit. That's not per se a nutritional quality. So a lot of products in the market, like nutrition bars, for example, or protein bars, are formulated with soy protein. So there was a boost since 1999 to date there was an 
tremendous increase in the utilization of soy protein in different products because of that claim. Bioactive peptides. So once the protein is hydrolyzed, you can hydrolyze the protein outside the body, produce a protein hydrolysate ingredient, or you, of course, when you digest the protein, you're going to generate small sequences or chains of uh, amino acid chains, or we call them peptides. And some of these peptides are bioactive. With that, they have some biological activity. Some of them are antidepressant. Some of them promote satiety. Some of them reduce hypertension. Some of them are antioxidants. So there are some physiological or biological benefits to peptides coming from proteins upon digestion. Other uh, indirect benefit is association of phytochemicals, which are chemicals that comes from plant. They come from plant, and they have physiological benefit. Such as isoflavones, there are phytochemicals present in soy. They're hydrophobic relatively, so they like to associate with hydrophobic moieties. Proteins have hydrophobic residues in them, so they like to live with the protein or associate with the protein. So when you consume soy protein, you are consuming phytochemicals as well with a long list of physiological benefits. All right. Um, okay. Proteins contribute to uh, physical characteristics as well. So we talked about nutrition, we talked about physiology, but of course they have physical contribution to the, to the food. Okay, so color. Casein in milk, which is one of the proteins in milk, ha is white, right? So it is light scattering, so it gives the white color of milk. Um, chromophores, myoglobin in meat gives the red color. Betalins in red beets also give the red color. Browning, of course, I don't know if have they, have you guys talked about Maillard yet? Okay, so uh, browning, you have the non-enzymatic, the Maillard reaction, and then you have the enzymatic, which is due to the um, uh, polyphenol oxidase enzyme that is naturally present in plant substances or like fruits or vegetables. So the non-enzymatic browning, uh, oh, that's the <laughs> curd, cheese curd, white. Uh, the non-enzymatic browning is their interaction of proteins, amine groups from protein, and reducing sugar. You'll learn about that, I think, when you talk about carbohydrates. You haven't done that yet. Carbohydrate? Okay, there is a section on browning itself. Anyway, it is the, the reaction of protein or amine groups in protein with reducing sugar. You get a series of reactions, a very complex reaction. You end up with brown pigments. So it is desirable in some instances, like when you bake the bread, you want that brown crust. That is a desirable Maillard reaction. But in a beverage, which I forgot to bring with me, if you have protein and you have high fructose corn syrup, fructose is a reducing sugar, and you leave it on the shelf, eventually that, that juice-based product will get brown, will brown over time. So this is undesirable browning. Uh, enzymatic, so you know, the apple, you cut it, and then it browns. It turned brown. And that's because when you cut the, the apple or cut any vegetable, you're exposing a phenols, phenol substances to the enzyme, the polyphenol oxidase. In the presence of oxygen, a series of reactions occur, and you get also brown colors. So that is undesirable. However, in tea, it is desirable. You want to get that brownish color in tea. So the enzymatic browning in tea is desirable. So proteins affect flavor. We'll learn about hydrophobic amino acid, acidic amino acid later in the next lecture. So hydrophobic amino acids, if you release, if you digest an enzyme, um, a protein using an enzyme outside of the body to produce an ingredient, and you release peptides that, are, that have a lot of hydrophobic amino acids, you'll taste the bitter bitterness. So hydrophobic amino acids are associated with the bitter 
flavor. Of course, you have acidic amino acids, so when you hydrolyze as well, you release carboxyl groups. We'll talk about peptides and when you break them, what happens, but you release, pepti uh, you release carboxyl groups, you have more sour taste. Also, if you have high percentage of acidic amino acids, you'll get sour taste as well. Cysteine, if you have a high amount of cysteine, like egg protein, you have the sulfur note. Egg proteins are really high in sulfur-containing amino acids, cysteine and methionine. So you get the sulfur note. MSG, monosodium glutamate, the umami flavor. That's a, we call it the sixth taste. You have five tastes, and this is the sixth one. Um, so monosodium glutamate is basically a glutamic acid or glutamate so instead of having OH here for the carboxyl group, you have a sodium. That makes it mono, one sodium, monosodium a glutamate. So glutamic acid, again, is an amino acid. Uh, proteolysis, so you, you make the cheese, and a lot of time, many of the cheeses are fermented or are aged. Over time, what happens during aging, you have a lot of enzymes that come from the bacteria that you added, uh, or from the endogenous um, microorganisms that produce enzymes during, uh, from, during aging. So what happens, there's a cocktail of enzymes. Some of them are lipases, some of them are proteases. Proteases will break down proteins and give you this, this uh, characteristic flavor of aged cheese. But the characteristic flavor of aged cheese is not just due to proteolysis, mind you, is also due to lipolysis, which is... Uh, lipase activity as well, where you break the fat. So you have fat breakdown and protein breakdown give you that sharp, distinctive flavor in aged cheese. Sweetness. So again, sweetness can be attributed to proteins in some cases, but in this case, it's not a protein, it's a dipeptide. A dipeptide meaning uh, just an, two amino acids linked together aspartic acid and phenylalanine. So when they're linked together and the dipeptide, just these two, they will give you aspartame, which is known commercially as aspartame, and it has this very sweet flavor. Other than color and taste, you have the actual physical structure. So you have the water binding capacity uh, water binding such as in tofu and gelation is in gel, coagulation is in cheese. So interaction of the protein with water. It can interact in so many different ways that either holds water or repels water. Um, solubility, we talked about it. The protein needs to be soluble. Anyway, not just for beverage application. If protein is not soluble, it's not going to function. If protein has zero solubility, this is not going to gel for you, not going to interact with water. It's not going to emulsify because you need to, to interact with water and oil, and it will not do anything. So solubility is key. Remember that. Emulsifying. So emulsification and foaming. In this case, you have the cake here. You have the ice cream. They're both systems that require emulsification and requires foaming. Uh, viscosity and elasticity in bread, viscoelastic properties. Viscosity sometimes is needed in different applications. So a muffin, for example, you use sometimes sodium caseinate in the muffin. It helps with the viscosity of the batter, thickening of the batter, and also it helps with emulsification. In other application, you need viscosity. For example, if you're making gravy or you're making uh, some viscous um, material, it's gravy. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. But you need the viscosity in your um, in your product. So, what causes these different functionality is basically chemical interactions. So, you have interactions chemical and physical, with other food components. So you have proteins interacting with other proteins, forming a gel, for example, or forming a film around an air bubble, or forming a film around an oil droplet. 
So interaction with proteins, interaction with lipids, as in emulsification, interaction with sugars, such as the Maillard reaction, interaction with water, obviously, through many different types of chemical bonding. You have the ionic, based on charge interaction, hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic, covalent. We'll talk about all of these interactions later lectures. Thus forming different structures. So once you have interaction, you have different structures. All right. All right. For every, everything in life has the positives and the negatives, right? So proteins are not perfect. You could have some anti-nutritive uh, factors and toxic components. Enzyme inhibitors are proteins, okay? So in soy, for example, you have trypsin inhibitor. Trypsin inhibitor is bad. Why? Because if you consume it, you have trypsin in your digestive system. Trypsin is an enzyme that will digest proteins. If you have a trypsin inhibitor, it's going to inhibit the digestion of protein. Then you will have digestive issues. So, whoops, why did I go? Okay, so you have digestive issues. What happens when you have soy protein or soy product, you have to process it to a point where you inhibit trypsin inhibitor, inactivate trypsin inhibitor before uh, consumption. Amylase inhibitor can be present in cereal. Amylase as well is a digestive enzyme in your digestive tract that will digest, digest starch. So if it's present, it will inhibit the digestion of starch. So again, you don't want that there. Proteins can be allergenic. This is only five different proteins, but the, there is the big eight. Uh, allergens um, declared by the FDA as big A. So you have milk, casein, and whey proteins. You have soybean. The main components of soybeans are glycinin and conglycinin proteins. Wheat, the gluten-forming proteins, pea pro peanut protein, egg white proteins collectively known as albumin. These are all five, but there is also three more. Do you know what the other three are? Fish. Shellfish, tree nuts. Okay. I didn't put them up there because you don't make protein ingredients usually from them. Uh, these, not only you find them in regular food, but you can also make protein ingredients out of them, and the protein ingredients are used in different applications. So, but because you have allergens, when, whenever a product is formulated with any of these energy or possible contamination, like in a processing line, sometimes you see a chocolate, M&Ms, don't have necessarily peanut in them, but they say on the package processed in a peanut processing plant. So you have to have this declaration. Contains sesame, wheat, gluten, and soya. They're all possible allergen. You have to make that declaration. Um, Toxic components. Unfortunately, when you process the meat, for example, like such as cured meat, so you have nitrites and you have proteins. So they can interact with each other and give you a toxic nitroso compound, such as these two. These are carcinogens. There are, for example, um, there are other MEs that could be produced when you um, cook the meat um, at very high temperature. Um, what it's not roasting. Uh, well, barbecuing. Yeah. So when you when you like burn your your meat, you are actually producing hydrocyclic amines, heterocyclic amines. So these are also carcinogenic. So so you have the processing may cause the production of toxic components. Lectins are natively present in some. Uh, beans or green beans. So there are proteins when consumed. If you consume a lot of raw beans, you might get those lectins and then in the intestine they might cause inflammation in the intestine. So it's, it's good to process or cook your beans so that you don't get those lectins um, in it. Um, other evidence, for example, is a protein in eggs and it binds biotin. It's a vitamin. And if it binds Biotin, it renders it physiologically not available. 
Uh, histamine found in fish products also is a vasoactive amine cause of kind of like an allergic reaction. Okay, moving on. So we talked about protein functionality, right? But very briefly, we'll talk about it expanded maybe lecture four or five. But what I want to say here is protein structure impacts function. Okay? However the protein makeup is will impact structure. And if you change the protein structure by processing or any environmental changes, you're going to change the structure. And once the structure is changed, the function is changed. So there are factors that impact protein structure. You have intrinsic factors. We call them native. Uh, that what, what makes the protein a native protein or in its nat natural form, original form. So intrinsic, that means native to the protein itself. So of course, different protein sources have different structure. Egg milk, example milk and soy, they're different proteins. They have different makeup. They have different amino acid composition. And they have different amino acid sequence. Sequence is very important. So what do you have first? You have glycine, then lysine, then isoleucine. That's the sequence in the peptide, the sequence of amino acids. Not how much glycine you have or how much valine you have or how much methionine you have. It's, where, it's also the sequence. So composition is the concentration of the different amino acids. And then, uh, or the makeup of the different amino acid, and then the amino acid sequence is how, where they are in the sequence of the peptide or polypeptide. The different ionizable and reactive groups, we will learn about the R groups in amino acids. So in the R group, you have different uh, ion, uh, can, uh, groups that can be ionized, or there are groups that can be functional groups. We'll talk about that. So the presence of ionizable and reactive groups impacts interactions impacts molecular interactions. Hydrophobicity is a very important characteristic. Surface hydrophobicity in particular is very important because it impacts foaming, it impacts solubility, it impacts emulsification. So the hydrophobicity is basically re directly related to the amino acids that are hydrophobic how much amino acids we have that are hydrophobic, and where are they located on the protein? Are they on the surface? Are they in the inside mostly? Conformation means the, the, the three-dimensional structure of your proteins. Of course, composition, the amino acid sequence, the reactive groups impact how the protein forms its native three-dimensional structure. We'll talk about this more when we talk about uh, secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures. But what you have is that you have either a globular protein, for example, or you have an open structure protein, and you have, uh, like I said, it impacts surface hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity of the protein. So conformation, and then molecular interactions interaction within the protein itself and interactions with other um, components in the system. So these are all intrinsic factor that dictates the protein structure. However, proteins, we usually we don't eat raw food, right? Oftentimes we process the food. And when we process, there are different in extrinsic factors that play a role. So we have environmental factors such as the pH of the system, temperature, the ionic strength or presence of salt, that is. So all of these may impact the ionizable groups on the protein, um, and may impact the structure. Temperature might cause the protein to denature. So they might impact the formation of the protein or the conformation of the protein. Processing, drying, heating, uh, using solvents to extract the fat, what happens to the protein after exposure to hexane. Uh, storage conditions, You've, you have a denatured protein in a, in a nutrition bar. Have you heard of a protein bar hardening? 
so the protein bars harden over time. Because during storage, these proteins are, have been heated, exposed to heat. They're denatured. Because they're denatured, you, they have active groups on the surface. They might interact with each other and you form polymers. And once you form polymers, you have this hardening uh, texture. You have a, when you bite, it's a hard texture. Um, and then there is a whole list of protein modification. You can modify the protein by enzymes, by chemical reagents, physical treatments like high pressure, uh, for example, natural reactions like the Maillard reaction, and biotechnology or genetic engineering. You can change the structure of the protein by all of these different mechanisms, and this you will learn about in chemical reactions if you are track A, food science major. Okay, so with all of this, you have your native structure turns into a denatured or modified structure due to extrinsic factors. So you will hear us talking about denatured proteins and causes of denaturation of the protein. So any extrinsic factor can have a bearing on the protein structure. With that, you have an effect on protein functionality, which is a, fu a functional property is any physicochemical property that affects processing and behavior of food systems as judged by the quality attributes of the final product. Quality attribute could be texture, could be flavor, could be color, um, anything. So you have the organoleptic, which is taste and color, uh, properties, you have three categories of functionality. You have the one that we call hydration, interaction with water mostly, so solubility and water holding. And then you have the surface properties. The surface properties of the protein that allows it to interact with an oil phase and an aqueous phase, such as an emulsification. The surface properties of the protein that allows it to interact with foam or air and allows it to interact with aqueous as well in a foam system. You have the structural properties that impacts viscosity, gelation, and viscoelastic properties. These will, you will have a visible, uh, you can see a visible texture if impact of the protein. So we'll start with intrinsic factors. So we'll, wa we'll walk our way to cover all these topics um, in the coming lectures. But we're going to start with the impact of intrinsic factors. OK, so impact of intrinsic factors, we talked about amino acid composition, so the makeup, the concentration of the different amino acids, and their sequence, structural configuration, how the protein goes from primary to secondary to tertiary, and in some cases also quaternary, we'll talk about that. The molecular interaction, whether within the protein itself or with different proteins to form a quaternary structure or with different components in the matrix. And then we'll talk about the chemical, bio, biochemical properties, the hydrophobicity of the protein and the net charge. These are very important characteristics that impact functionality. So proteins from different sources differ in all of these. Because proteins are different, they're very complex molecules, each protein will function differently. You won't find two proteins from two different sources exactly the same. Soy protein is different than milk proteins, and it's different than gluten proteins. So you won't find two different sources with the same structure, same function. All right, let's start from the very beginning. I'm sure all of you have taken this at one point in time. But a refresher is important, especially when we want to understand the impact of structure on function. All right, so basic structure, your amino acid. Your amino acid is composed of a chiral carbon most of the time. There are some cases where you don't have chiral carbon. A chiral carbon means it has four different bonds. So it, has, it is bonded to four different functional groups. That's a chiral carbon. Glycine, for example, is one amino acid that doesn't have a chiral carbon because its R group is H. 
So there are amino acids that don't have chiral carbon, but in most cases, you have a chiral carbon. This carbon here, it has an hydrogen, it has an amine group, and a carboxyl group. So you want to know the names of these groups. Amine group, carboxyl group, this is acid, this is base, your hydrogen, and then the R group. Okay, talk about the R group in a minute. But this is the natural configuration, and we call it the L configuration, or left. What's on the left is your amine group. This is the natural configuration of amino acids in food. All right, at neutral pH, so you got this amino acid in a neutral pH, close to seven. What happens here, the amine group picks up a proton. Proton is the H plus. So then it carries a positive charge. The carboxyl group, it's acidic. Acid wants to give out a proton. They're very generous with their protons. So it will give up its proton, and it becomes negatively charged. So the carboxyl group donates a proton. The amine group picks up a proton. That's what differentiates base from acid. Bases like to pick up protons. Acids like to give you protons, OK? And then. So this is basic because it's giving you a proton, or taking up a proton, sorry. And this is acidic, it's giving a proton. So having base and acid at the same time makes it a buffer. If you, I don't know if you ever heard, but proteins are excellent buffers because they have the amine groups and they have the carboxyl groups. What is the definition of buffer? What does a buffer do? You guys should know this. I'm sure you do. Don't be shy. Tell me, what is a buffer? I like people to talk to me. OK. What's, what's that? Yes, perfect. It resists change in pH. How does it do that? So if I'm titrating with an acid, so I'm giving, let's say I'm titrating with HCl, so I'm giving the systems protons, okay? So this eventually, carboxyl group will pick up a proton. There are excess protons in the system. Why not pick up one? So once it picks it up, the pH does not drop because it got picked up by a carboxyl group. All right, let's do the other, the other uh, way. If you're titrating with NOH, so you're giving OH minuses to your system. With the OH minus, the more you have OH minus in there, your amine group is going to say, OK, I'm going to give you my proton now. Resistantly, but will give it the proton. So once the proton is given to the system, it neutralizes the pH. You don't get an increase in pH. So that's how it functions. You have the positive and you have the negative. You have the capacity to pick up hydrogen or protons. You have the capacity to give protons the pH where is this change. So try to put proteins in water and try to change the pH, lower it down. If you have just water or protein in water, you require much more acid to bring the water and protein down to the same pH as the water. So more acid here, less acid there to get equal pH. That's why when you, the, the most drawback for uh, fruit beverages with high protein content, it's, it's sourness. So there's a lot of acid added to make it a lower pH to call it a fruit juice. All right. The R group, which is the last thing I'm going to talk about before I let you leave. Uh, so the R group is a uh, different functional group. So it could be a hydrocarbon. It could be a phenyl group, a phenol group. So the R group determines polarity. So if it is uh, charged, it would be polar, for example. Determine hydrophobicity. If it's a long chain of carbons and hydrogen, it would be hydrophobic. Um, it impacts structure because it impacts interaction with different functional groups. 
reactions and interactions and functionality. R group is the most es essential component of your amino acid. It impacts everything, impacts structure, and therefore it impacts function. And I will let you guys go, and we'll continue on Wednesday.